Hello and welcome to Tomorrow Space, everybody. Orbit 12.33. Very glad to have you all watching here today. It's going to be a particularly interesting episode because we have Robin Haig, the lead engineer of Skyrora, a small sat launcher that's currently uh, in the United Kingdom getting sort of underway uh, with everything that they have. And Robin, there is quite a aerospace history in the United Kingdom itself. So um, it's not just like something that's suddenly popping on the scene. Aerospace has been involved there for a very long time. Yes, yes. So we've had a, a, a very strong aviation industry, but we do actually have a history of launch vehicles as well. Unfortunately, it was uh, it was cut off. We're the only country to have developed the capability of putting things into orbit and then willfully cancelled it again. Um, <clears throat> so there was a launch of a UK satellite by a UK vehicle, Black Arrow, in uh, October twenty uh, October nineteen seventy one, and uh, and that was it. So we are hoping that we will be the first ones up. Um, after uh, since then, the the first new British launch vehicle. Mm -hmm. And with the Black Arrow program, what were what were sort of the specifics of it? Was it just get something into space, or was it going to be something more? And then it got cut off prematurely. It was a technology demonstrator. Um, so, uh, in the mid fifties, UK and US decided to cooperate cooperate on developing. Uh, missile systems that were appropriate for our ranges. So uh, while the US was doing Atlas, um, we, uh, the UK was doing Blue Streak as an intermediate range ballistic missile that suited the, the distance that we needed to launch over. And um, uh, a sub, uh, an, an extra program was set up in parallel of small vehicles, uh, starting with Black Knight, to investigate re-entry uh, for the for the payloads from the missiles. And um, Black Knight stood about 30, 40 foot tall, uh, three foot across, and uh, flew as Black Arrow ultimately did in the desert in Australia from Woomera. <clears throat> and um, it was a, a very successful program, such that uh, the UK, we were actually the world leaders in re-entry science at the time, and the US came and joined our program. And um, ultimately, Blue Streak became the basis of the first joint European launcher after it was cancelled as a missile. And um, the, uh, the government organization, RAE, Royal Aircraft Establishment, that was the, um, the uh, program authority for Black Knight, succeeded in getting go the, the go ahead to try and create a technology demonstrating launch vehicle out of the Black Knight technology. So Blue Streak was like Atlas. It was uh, um, begun with at licensed Atlas technology. So it was Kerolox. But Black Arrow and Black Knight were based on hydrogen peroxide and kerosene, uh, which was a, a, an unusual propellant combination that became something of a, a UK, UK specialty. And um, it's actually what we're looking to use at Skyrora. It's what we're working on um, because it, it gives a a number of advantages across the vehicle and across across the uh, the vehicle operations, but um, we've actually been involved in recovering Black Arrow uh, because uh, because it was flown from Australia, uh, South Australia, in a, into a polar orbit going northwards. The first stage actually came down on land and uh, was recovered and put on display in a, a a town park in the outback for forty years. And uh, we, we've been involved in bringing it back to the UK. That same, the, the footage that you saw of Black Arrow launching that same first stage, after it's been up to 54 kilometers and then fallen back without a parachute, it's in a surprisingly good condition. So uh, we're, we're hoping we can get that into a, a suitable national museum soon. But um, it's, uh, it, it, that's been fascinating to see that, that real hardware. And um, while we don't have a direct design link, uh, but to see the heritage, the, um, the, the peroxide kerosene UK engine heritage that we're building upon 
And with aerospace in the UK today, what's it look like? Because I know there's been announcements of potential launch sites um, in various places around the UK, but is there sort of a homegrown space flight capability that's coming back? Uh, or, is it, or is it just primarily looking at launch sites? Uh, Snow, there's a, there's a number of companies uh, at various stages of development. Uh, we, we like to think that we're, uh, we're at the front of that um, field. Um, but uh, yes, there's a number of companies that are interested in creating launches in the UK and flying them from the prospective launch site. This is a, a tremendous uh, turnaround. Um, after the cancellation of the government programs in the 70s, the government really focused on satellite technology. And we have a, a very strong, long-standing satellite and space probe um, uh, supply chain and um, industry in the UK, which it has not actually been that widely recognized by the public. But now, since about 2010, there's been a, a turnaround of a big interest in having UK launch, because then that means that we can supply the, the, entire, the entire package of uh, payload development, spacecraft construction, spacecraft launch operations, and uh, actually the debt, the, uh, the um, the downlink and the, the uh, big data projects as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the UK's had a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration with Europe. Is that something that's sort of going to be continuing in the aerospace industry in the in the near future? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, ESA is not part of the European Union. So fortunately, it's, it's unaffected by whatever might happen in the next few weeks. And uh, sort of moving over to talking about uh, Skyrora now, since we got a little bit of the historical foundation of, uh, of where uh, the company's coming from. From our YouTube chat room, Astro YYZ is actually asking, can you explain where the name Skyrora comes from? Because that's a pretty cool name, I got to say. Um, it, it was uh, one of the founders who came up with it as they were, they were just trying to put together something, something concerning Sky, skyrocket and uh, space and it, it's it's an abstract name but I think it's worked out very well and with what you are attempting to do it's essentially a small sat capability is that what it is yes yes we're looking to be able to put around 300 kilos up into um, as, a, as a reference a 500 kilometers on synchronous orbit from the north of Scotland um, there are three contenders for being launch sites from Scotland, all, all across the north, because it's the only place there where we've got an un, un, in, uninterrupted track up over the pole. And uh, we're, we're friends with all three. We're, we're waiting to see who, uh, who ultimately is in a position to let it launch. And with the market so full of small sat launchers, because that's, that's something that just can't sort yes. of be gotten around right now. Um, what separates Skyrora from everybody else who is chomping at the bit right now to get a, a piece of the action in the, small, in the upcoming small sat uh, industry? So at, at this stage, we, uh, we feel we're, um, we've made the important step because there's I think last count, what, 120 projects or something, at different, uh, country, companies at different stages. An awful lot of them are uh, websites and PowerPoints, but we've moved into real hardware. We've got our upper stage engine tested. Our um, uh, la next larger engine um, is under construction. We've been flying electronics in small vehicles using cheap, quick, commercial, off-the-shelf off solid rocket motors. And um, but the, the significant thing is that we do ha now have our own bioliquid rocket engines. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about uh, the flight tests that you've done uh, with those rockets, specifically what you do with them. And then also um, myself and Dutta on the show, we are actually we actually are licensed high power rocketry uh, hobbyists here in the United States. So uh, when I was reading up about the motors that those flew on, I was like, oh yeah, I've seen a couple of those motors uh, yes. you know, fly here in the desert in California before. So is there, is there a distinct advantage in using stuff that is commercially off the shelf? Most definitely. It's um, a cheaper and quicker, quicker way of putting electronics to a real flight environment. I mean, for that matter, the, uh, the, rapid acceleration and vibration of uh, 
solid rocket motors is going to be is, is a tougher environment than uh, bi-liquid vehicles will be subjecting the electronics and the payloads to. But <clears throat> one of the most important things, even even dealing with relatively small vehicles like um, you, you will see uh, some of the pictures of, is just the, the sheer experience of getting something launched because there, there isn't that much experience of that in the UK. Um, and um, the uh, the vehicles so far have been certainly of a of a scale that you'll be very familiar with from the from the deserts uh, in the US because you have so much more space to fly vehicles like that. Uh, we're now pushing on with um, uh, the next one up, where is is still the uh, commercially available solid rocket motors, pushing up to about sort of uh, thirty kilometers something like that, which will be the um, we believe the highest and fastest civilian rocket uh, launched within the UK so far, and probably as, as high as we can possibly go on land for a, for a land recovery. After that, we're onto the coast, we're onto one of the prospective launch sites. But um, it, uh, it does make uh, such a difference to the, the, uh, the speed and the, um, the, the competence of the team to be doing real practical stuff and not just gradually taking years working towards the big vehicles in the end. So it's not necessarily just about flying the hardware and seeing how the hardware is going to react when you put it in an environment like that. It's also sort of getting the team of people set up and yes. learning how to do launch operations. Yeah. The, uh, the, the procedural approach, e even with a small vehicle, treating a small vehicle like a large one. Um, and um, after, after our next one that we're working towards the, the 30 kilometer one, which should be reasonably soon, um, we have then the, the perfect stepping stone from the solids onto the bi-liquids because it's a hybrid, a hydrogen peroxide hybrid called Sky High. And um, then that one will be taking us up to sort of 80 kilometers scale, 80 kilometers altitude, uh, at pushing into genuine near space territory. And what have you learned from the tests besides uh, the operations and, and seeing how the electronics run? Have you had any surprises during these, uh, these test flights? Um, no, they, I mean, the, the flights themselves have gone quite well. I, um, myself and a, a, a number of other people involved ha have been involved in relatively large high power rocketry and su such that can be fitted in the UK previously. So the flights have gone well um, and um, the, uh, the predictions of the flights have gone well. Uh, one of the um, unexpected benefits so far of, um, of these vehicles is we have found the outer limits of the legislation of the uh, the regulations because the, there's a tremendous will to uh, intent to have launched to space from the uk but the regulations are are still being developed the legal situation is still being developed and uh, our next vehicle up micro that uh, was just second in the the lineup that you could see on on the screen is um uh, currently we're, we're working with the cea and the uk space agency on the vehicle of that size to determine how we go about getting permission and regulating it and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you go about getting permission and regulating that? Because here in the United States, we have a lot of stuff established. Um, so, um, some of, so I'm sure a lot of our viewers in the United States aren't probably aware of what it took to regulate all of that. Um, so specifically in the United Kingdom, since you're, you're on the ground game, you are, you are at the beginnings, of the flight program, I guess, a uh, good way to describe it. Um, what does that take? Are you working directly with governments and you're, basi and you're basically saying, you know, this is how these work and do you start literally down at the lowest level and kind of work your way up? Do you include everybody all at once? How do, how do you develop those regulations? So the, um, the UK Space Agency is working on, on that at the moment. The um, CEA is our aviation authority like the FAA. And those, those two are working together because then they will be managing it from an air traffic and a space traffic point of view. And uh, we, so we're then cooperating with them, but also uh, amongst larger industry bodies within the UK of everyone that's got an interest, the people that want to do the spaceports or the people that want to do the launching um, across the board, we're trying to find the way through because we have a we uh, have a, a legislation half in place. The Space Industry Act is 
is started, but the fine detail of it is not complete yet. So um, it's a it's an opportunity because we we have a, a new we have a blank sheet to then look at everybody else's best practice and put together a, a good legislative regime. Mm -hmm. And talking a little bit about the opportunity for flights and the type of flights you can uh, you can do, a uh, little cripple in our YouTube channel is asking: Are polar orbits the target, or are there other plans? And I would imagine launching uh, equatorially uh, from Scotland may be a bit of a problem because you've got Europe, uh, proper you know all the all those countries to the east of you uh, there. So yes, so yes, so UK. Uh, it, it's only polar and sunsink that we're looking at from, from the British space port. But um, our system is designed to be as, um, as user-friendly, as flexible, as low impact as possible. So we certainly could look at uh, going to an equatorial space port as well in future once things are up and running. But our, our big focus is to be able to launch the small payloads from the UK space port. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Astro YYZ in our YouTube channel uh, is asking a, another really great question, um, which is, would Skyrora be interested in uh, returning to doing flights in the Rumera range, uh, you know, in Australia, perhaps, you know, partnering up with the new Australian Space Agency to do that? Well, we've, we're all always interested to uh, to speak to anyone about, about launching, and uh, Australia provides a an, an excellent place in, in which to do it. I know that uh, Woomera itself is remaining a military installation, but uh, there are two uh, two sites that are interested in being new launch sites from Australia, one from the north coast, uh, north and uh, north and east, I believe, and then also from the south coast for polar orbits going straight off over Antarctica. So it's going to be interesting to see how those develop. It's great how so many different places now are, uh, are interested in getting into space in some way. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about Skyrora's uh, endgame. You've, you're working on all these test flights and, and kind of incrementally working your way. What's your, what's your big rocket? Uh, tell, us, you know, tell us about your big rocket that you're working towards. Yes, yeah, certainly. So the, uh, the ultimate goal at the moment is the Skyrora, is the, uh, Skyrora XL. It's 2.2 uh, meters, there, there we go, you can see it at the side of the screen, 2.2 meters across, uh, 24 meters tall. So uh, we're an Edinburgh-based uh, company, so if, uh, if uh, any viewers have been to Edinburgh and are familiar with the Scott Monument on Princess Street, big spiky, looks like a Gothic spaceship actually, with, we're, we're going to stand about as tall as that. And uh, this, this vehicle is in three stages, it's all using um, hydrogen peroxide and kerosene, a storable system. So hydrogen peroxide has not seen a, a lot of use of late uh, it, because the performance is slightly down from liquid oxygen, but uh, taken holistically for the, uh, for the, the vehicle design and the, the whole logistics, it gives us a lot of good things. So it's, it's ambient, uh, uh, ambient propellant along with kerosene. So there's no cryogens to deal with and all of the problems that uh, cryogenic liquids bring. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it also runs in a very high oxidizer to fuel ratio uh, because uh, peroxide is, is H2O2 and um, the, uh, the, the extra oxygen splitting off the water, the extra O2 coming off the H2O2 releases more energy in itself. And uh, so the, the bias towards the peroxide, uh, which is a very dense propellant, it's about 35% denser than liquid oxygen, 1400 kilos per cubic meter instead of uh, say uh, a, a thousand kilos per cubic meter for water or 800 for kerosene, it means it, it biases the design of the rocket towards the dense propellant. If you see a cross section through Black Arrow in, uh, on Wikipedia or something, it's almost all peroxide tank with these tiny little kerosene tanks. So it, it makes for a simple, efficient, compact vehicle that um, doesn't have to deal with cryogens and also is Kind, give, kind of give you the advantages of a hypergolic system, you know, where if you mix the, the propellants together, that they, they light instantly. So peroxide and kerosene don't do that outside the chamber, but uh, hydrogen peroxide can uh, be catalytically decomposed. This is the same system that the uh, original Bell rocket belt flew on um, without any other fuel. 
if you force hydrogen peroxide through a silver mesh, it falls apart spontaneously into 600 degree steam and oxygen. Uh, so our engines, uh, in common actually with the Black Arrow engines, have a catalyst pack at the top of the engine, a stack of mesh. And the, the, uh, sorry, the peroxide, which is used for cooling, because we've got a lot of it, you know, it's water plus, it's a really good coolant. Uh, the peroxide cools the engines and then passes through this catalyst pack, which means that uh, it, already your oxidizer is, is a, a superheated gas coming into the chamber and then you need only add the kerosene and it'll self-light. So what we can see here now is our upper stage engine, Leo, being tested at Spaceport Cornwall. It uh, produces 350 kilos of thrust. And this is our third stage engine. This is the one which will be finally putting pushing satellites on into orbit. And uh, because of the catalytic ignition that we can do with peroxide, it also means it's intrinsically restartable. So uh, our third stage, uh, the having three stages gives a lot of flexibility anyway, but our third stage can easily relight and uh, put multiple payloads into different different places. So super simple, it sounds like. Well, yes, relatively simple for <laughs> for yes. rockets. Um, it, let's not let's not completely say, you know, really simple here. Um, and in fact, uh, Zapfan Zapfan is actually asking in our YouTube channel um, if the engines are pressure fed or turbo pumps. So um, just yeah. I guess just how so, simple is it? The um, the one we just saw running uh, under test is pressure fed in the third stage. Um, just uh, uh, typical helium pressurization. The first and second stage are pump fed. And uh, again, building on the, the kind of heritage that you see with um, Black Arrow from, from the UK peroxide engines, the turbo pumps actually run on decomposed peroxide. So you have a, another gas generator with a catalyst pack of mesh in it and um, force some of the peroxide through that, which makes 600 degree steam. So you run the, the turbo pump as a steam turbine. And um, uh, we're, we're <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so it, it gives us another advantage with the turbo pumps in that your turbine only has to cope with a few hundred degrees instead of a few thousand. And there's no mixture ratio control. So for the engines, the peroxide system makes it um, self starting, easily relight relightable. And uh, um, excellent for mixing because it's coming in as a, a stream of uh, hot gas and simplifies the turbo pumps. So the two biggest challenges when creating a new rocket propulsion system, the injector design and the turbo pump are sidestepped by us using uh, per peroxide with catalytic decomposition. Yeah, and uh, John Benstead in our YouTube channel is asking, is pure hydrogen peroxide difficult to handle? I'm about to go play with some 30% uh, hydrogen peroxide tonight at, at my job for some science demos for kids. Um, and that- I thought that was more for the hair. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, at 30%, I would still like to have a scalp um, at that point. <laughs> um, so uh, so what about uh, pure hydrogen peroxide? Is it, you still, I would imagine you still have to have obviously a certain level of safety with it. Yes. It's, um, as, as with any oxidizer, it just must be treated with respect, treated appropriately. Um, I, I know that there is a perception of peroxide as something that's particularly difficult, but it's, it, it's um, easier, I would say, than LOX, because uh, it, it's, it should be treated like LOX, but you don't have the super cold temperatures to deal with. Um, it's, uh, again, uh, keeping the, the system uh, clean considering the material co compatibility of the, the di different things that are being built into it. Um, but um, it, uh, it, it, the other advantage over the cryogenics is it's not going to boil off. So it can be stored in aluminium containers for a long time. Uh, one thing which we think might give us a, a logistical advantage is as we're trying to fly in, um, trying to launch from Northern Europe, we expect there'll be somewhat more in the way of weather holds than um, Vandenberg or, or Canaveral. So if we get a weather hold, if we ha have trouble with wind or whatever, as long as it's not actually too windy for the vehicle to stay, still stay out there, it can just sit and wait. We don't have to detank anything because nothing is going to boil off. Um, our peroxide that we're dealing with is 90%. So uh, there's, still, there's still some water in there. Um, 
I, I know that some systems are looking at using 98% uh, as a model of propellant, but then the temperature as it de decomposes is such that you, you need much more advanced catalysts. Uh, whereas at 90%, we can just use the, uh, the silver coated mesh. And we actually have two people asking uh, <laughs> in our YouTube chat room about what it's built out of. NRJ is like, is it aluminum or carbon fiber? And then John Benstead is uh, asking, is it stainless steel? Because that's now all the rage to build rockets out of. Because, uh, you know, that's never yes, happened before. Um, so. <laughs> it's, it's, that's the way of the future, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we're, um, uh, we are a combination of uh, aluminum structures and uh, carbon composite structures. It, our approach, because the um, the cost cost per kilo is always going to be a little bit higher for a small launcher. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, you're buying the 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 dedicated launch, the the more tailored launch. But we must still focus on being competitive. And uh, so, with Skyrora, what we're particularly trying to do is to des design very much for manufacturing manufacturability, make it cheap and quick and easy to create the vehicles and to, to use them. Much as, as SpaceX, one of the things they did, I understand, when, when starting off was just make the choice of making sure you're using the same propellants through all the stages and not ending up with multiple different, uh, multiple propellant combinations for different stages. So lots of little things like that across the board can make us uh, cheaper and more cost effective. So uh, we're, we're a mixture of relatively conventional aluminum and uh, aerospace composites. Mm -hmm. And uh, launching from your three sites that you have, you mentioned that weather is going to be a little bit of an issue um, with that. Is there any particular advantage from from any of your three launch sites that you're looking at? Like when we had uh, Peter Beck on to talk about Electron and launching from New Zealand, um, he said one of the really big advantages of that was that um, throughout an entire year, there's like a single digit number of times that in that an airplane may violate the range. Um, you know, like it's like there's right. like almost nothing in in and around the area that they launch to. Um, so is there something similar to that? Um, or is it just kind of like keeping things close together, uh, you know, not having to transport far? It's, um, it, yes, it, it's um, being able to do things all, all within the, the UK's uh, sort of legislative and, and, and export area. Um, Glasgow has been recently uh, become a, a major hub for small satellite manufacture, just the sort of thing that we're looking to fly. Um, and so uh, not only UK, but actually Scotland within the UK can then provide the whole supply chain in, in one place. And but uh, we, oh. it's actually uh, dealing with the uh, dealing with the aircraft is, is reasonably straightforward traffic management as long as you you're planned in. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see one of our, our little rockets flying at the moment. This is Nano. Um, this is our smallest, our lowest and our slowest. It's higher, faster and further from here on. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's it, 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 even on this scale, um, you know, it's it's great. It's uh, the same thing that makes the satellites so much smaller means that uh, genuinely useful uh, electronics, uh, electronics that's genuinely useful to the main program can be flowed on rockets this small and uh, to, to do useful work with them and, and get some really cool pictures. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting that. Uh, that sky in there a bit darker and um, seeing more of the curve than we have on this particular footage. Yeah, and I, I got to say, uh, looking at the onboard footage, the rocket is barely rolling um, as it goes up on both of those test flights. Um, so yes. uh, I know that for me and Dada, that tells us that that was a very well-built rocket. Um, <laughs> since it's oh, well, well, thank you very much. Flying <laughs> so nice with that there. Yeah, it's not like some, <laughs> some of the onboard footage where we see just you know, spinning around and it's going to make you, make you nauseous uh, just watching it even on YouTube. Um, and it's interesting. I haven't seen some of these pictures. Yeah, well, oh, surprise. You, you've got... Yeah, look at the power of the internet. I shall have to ask the office to show me. So yeah, uh, so <laughs> Space Vogel, um, actually, from our IRC chat, has something. Since you just mentioned the office, uh, Space Vogel is asking, uh, could you talk a bit more about your team? There's an R&D center in the Ukraine, and uh, I believe you know how does this kind of cooperation work? Yes, certainly. So we're 
our, our main focus is UK and uh, building up uh, the, the capability around Edinburgh. We have uh, our headquarters is, is on Princess Street. So for anyone that knows Edinburgh, we're look, looking directly out at the castle. And um, if you're, uh, because the offices are, are on that street, we're above some of the shops on the street. So if you're, if you're walking past Next or Levi's, you can see a mock-up of a, a satellite launch vehicle in the window. Um, we have uh, a uh, main workshop on the outside edge of Edinburgh in a in a location that's a bit more suitable than the, the dead centre of the city for uh, for doing the practical work. And uh, we're just in the advanced stages of setting up a, a, a test site for the for ground testing the engines near Edinburgh, uh, so that we can do everything as conveniently as possible. We do have the uh, the centre in, in Ukraine in Dnipro. Um, so um, we're looking to uh, to draw in some of the tremendous experience that's uh, you know Dnipro's rocket city. Um, it was a, a, a huge center for the uh, the space flight going back to the, the Soviet program, and um, they have the advantage that their their launch vehicle heritage has continued, um, although they're a little bit stuck at the moment with the political situation. But um, they they have that heritage connected, whereas uh, ours was cut off. So um, it, it's um, we 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 like to very much think uh, as think of ourselves as a, a Scottish but multinational com company, uh, a European company, and uh, we, we're trying to work best across uh, across the continent. And you are the lead engineer. What does that entail for you? What do you have to do? So. Um, we're, we're still not that large a team, so uh, you know every, everyone everyone gets involved in everything. But um, at, at the moment, um, I'm currently involved in uh, aspects of the engine assembly and the the vehicle assembly, and planning for the at the, the moment planning for for the launch of some of the small flights. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you like jump on the shop floor and kind of take a look at everything. Nice little like hands on kind of yes. stuff. Yes, we're 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 very much. Um, all, all involved with all stages of it. And uh, some... It's a, a fascinating place to be working at the moment, sorry. Oh yeah, oh no, well tell us, like, what, what are some of the cool things that you get to uh, kind of take a look at? Well, um, uh, currently uh, it's just, we see uh, engine hardware coming together, the, the, the real stuff is um, for the big bioliquids is coming together, uh, while at the same time sort of uh, actually pe people physically building the the complete small rockets nearby as well and uh kind of talk about some of those other uh you know companies trey Harmon on youtube is saying people uh i.e americans okay trey that's uh fair enough uh seem to confuse skyora and orbex of the uk are you familiar with them and uh what do you see as the main differences between your two companies yes yes certainly so um uh, we 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 know them. We uh, we've, we've we've met them at a number of events. Uh, their system is a, a different propulsion concept. They're a, li a liquid oxygen and um, propane, which they I understand they hope to derive from biofuel sources. Um, and uh, their two stages again um, conventional uh, gas generator turbopump system, I believe, um, and uh, all composite structure. And uh, it, it's we we haven't seen so much yet from them, but I'm I'm confident that they're they're building away as well. So it's uh, I, I look forward to finding out more about their system. And one thing that I found very interesting on your website uh, in listing uh, talking about the rockets that you're going to be flying is that you actually put a section on the environmental work that goes in with your rockets yes. and how much carbon dioxide per launch and, and everything like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, it is, it's, a, it's another advantage of um, hydrogen peroxide is uh, it burns very cleanly. So, um, uh, but, but beyond that, actually, as a, as a new launch vehicle, as a, a clean sheet, a fresh system, we want to minimize our impact. We want to be as close to zero carbon as we can be. So uh, we, we think about that across all aspects of what we're doing. 
um, from the, the efficiency of the, co the combustion, the handling of the propellants, not losing any propellant into the, into the environment, and um, uh, looking at sourcing uh, kerosene from uh, waste material streams, which is something that is, is, we hope to be able to do in the near future. Yeah, and I noticed um, last night I did some math real quick just to kind of compare uh, my Jeep to one of your rocket launches. And one of your rocket launches uh, puts out about one-tenth the amount of carbon dioxide that my Jeep does in a year. So my Jeep, if I did my math right, that would put it at about 3,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide a year, something like that. So, um, so you guys are, are below one-tenth of that uh, per launch. So that's... Uh, that's pretty cool. That, I, you know, I never really thought, we don't really think about that, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely amazing that, uh, that a rocket could put out so little carbon dioxide with, uh, with that, so. <laughs> yeah, with a yeah. hydrocarbon system. Well, I mean, the um, space is obviously, uh, uh, space technology has been critical to helping our understanding of, of the Earth and is critical to the continued monitoring of the, the current state of the climate. And um, yet, space launch it, itself, um, as, as uh, Elon mentioned, is not very amenable to electrification. So we have to consider minimizing carbon. We, we ideally need zero carbon space launch. And obviously, I know li liquid oxygen hydrogen systems do provide that anyway. Um, but hydrogen is, is a very challenging stuff to deal with. So if we can do low carbon or zero carbon launch without having to resort to liquid hydrogen, then um, that's, uh, that can only be a good thing, especially as we're looking at, at ourselves and, and many places are looking at launching more and more now. Mm -hmm. And uh, timelines are always something that everybody is asking about uh, for, for space startup companies. And Graham W in our YouTube chat room is uh, asking, when will Skyrora do their first launch? And you've already done test launches, but I suppose with your larger vehicle, when, when are you looking orbit, at doing it? that? <laughs> So um, we expect to be ready towards the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. 2021, okay. For the, yeah. Um, obviously, it's, uh, there's, there's always things that can come up. It's, um, uh, we, we hope to do better than that on time. Um, it's, uh, uh, yes, around that kind of time, 2021, 2022, to start up, uh, to do our first flights. And um, we hope to get into commercial operation as quickly as possible, obviously. And what are some of the things that we should be looking from uh, looking at from Skyra from now until you start flying? So um, we have uh, the the two stage solid going to thirty kilometers, one hundred thousand feet, and uh, uh, scale out micro. Uh, we will have a significant ground test of three ton thrust rocket engine near Edinburgh in the very near future. Um, we should be, we, we will have the turbo pump, that the turbo pump system is progressing. Um, so we will have something to show about that in the near future. And um, we have then the, the sky high hybrid launch to near space, which we uh, uh, hope to be able to be doing very soon as well, probably, uh, probably early next year. And uh, our suborbital sub bi-liquid vehicle, SK-1, which you uh, can see in the lineup, if, if you see on our website again, is um, a single-stage pressure-fed peroxide kerosene uh, suborbital vehicle capable of taking about 90, ki 90 kilos to around 100 kilometers altitude. And um, that one should be ready. There we go, Skyrover 1. Um, Skylark L, as um, we're now going to call it. And uh, that... Uh, that will be available to fly. Uh, I think um, I'm optimistic we'll be in a, a position to fly it by the end of next summer. And uh, we are, are getting a lot of interest in it actually as a suborbital vehicle. Um, whereas uh, initially it was planned just primarily for our own developmental step. Um, uh, there, there is a lot of interest because we can provide, we, we believe we can provide the same cost and convenience advantages to scientific suborbital flights that we are working towards to provide for orbital flights. And um, ag again, to provide that, that extra capability within the UK to uh, 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 companies and universities that would otherwise have to go further afield could be a good opportunity. And Raj Luthra in our YouTube channel is asking the question that anybody who starts up 
um, a spaceflight company nowadays is asked, which is, will your rockets be reusable? Um, everybody just throws that at everyone. So uh, will they? Yes. Well, uh, it's it's always more difficult for a small launch a small launcher to be reused because you don't have the same spare percentage. The the, the spare percentage of mass is inevitably going to be smaller. And I was uh, very interested to see um, Rocket Lab uh, looking at catching the electron by parachute. And um, at the moment, uh, we're we're expecting we are starting off expendable. But I'm I think everyone has to consider reusability because SpaceX will make us. <laughs> yeah, they're they're putting a little pressure on the small sat launch uh, launch industry yes. with their their just on on everybody. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild that they're doing that. Um, and I mean, we've just there's multiple questions in the same vein, so I suppose I should ask it from our chat room. Both of them in YouTube. Uh, Sarge Enzyme is asking: Is Skyrora recruiting for any positions? And the capa the capacitor is asking any job vacancies available. So uh, I guess we might have uh, quite a few viewers from uh, the UK watching. So um, we, we do have some. Um, so I, I believe they're on the website. If you just keep an eye on the website and uh, our social media, we, we um, uh, are make quite active use of our social media strands and uh, vacancies will be, will be up. So I'm, I'm sure they're on the website. Probably somebody will message me to tell me. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that they're up there, you can find them, and uh, you can keep an eye out on uh, on uh, us on Twitter and Instagram and uh, all the usual places. Mm -hmm. And if folks would like to know more about Skyrora, where can they go to do that? Um, Skyrora.com uh, is the, is the, the the best place for the overall information, and then and then the social medias. All right. Well, Robin, lead engineer at Skyra, uh, fantastic stuff. Can't wait to see, uh, especially with non-cryogenic propellants, that, uh, that's pretty exciting. So uh, being able to handle that a uh, little bit easier than cryogenics. Uh, so yes. yeah, spilling hydrogen peroxide doesn't sound as bad as spilling uh, liquid oxygen uh, everywhere on a shop floor. Still not fun. It's, um, <laughs> it's it, yes, we, we still don't, don't want to do it, but um, it, uh, it it does does have its advantages. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, I'm just really excited about it. Seeing uh, seeing the UK get into it because it's always great to have more countries get involved, um, especially internationally. Because here in the United States, obviously, we focus so much on what the US is doing, um, but to see other countries getting involved, it's uh, it's very it's very exciting time, especially for the small sad industry. So, so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Best of luck to you guys and uh, looking forward to Thank you very much. all of the updates that are coming with that as well. Um, and not only am I just excited about the internationalness or I guess the rise of international companies for the small sat uh, industry, I'm also excited because here tomorrow we have quite an international audience uh, and our citizens who help us here at the show and uh, make these shows possible come from all over the world. And I think that's so interesting. I think with our, our statistics, it's something like only 50% of our viewers are from the United States. Um, yeah, yeah, and- uh, I can talk to you, less than 50%. Oh, less than 50% as they're telling me in the booth. Yeah, so, um, so we, I mean, truly a international show uh, that we have here. So that was really great to have uh, Robin and uh, Skyrora on to kind of talk about that. And we wouldn't be able to do this without you. And if you got something out of this and you'd like to give a little something back, you can head on over to youtube.com slash join slash TMRO. Uh, we still do have our Patreon available as well, patreon.com slash TMRO. Uh, we are not getting rid of our Patreon. We are not, if you're gonna stay on Patreon, we're not gonna like remove your rewards or anything. You're gonna get the exact same stuff that people on YouTube do, uh, but we're just gonna concentrate a little bit more on YouTube because we kind of like it, uh, kind of keeping it within where we're at. And in addition to that, you may wanna take a look at some of the upcoming uh, things that we're gonna be implementing for our citizens as well, where you're gonna be able to listen into us as we're doing uh, script reviews for news, uh, even potentially hear audio channels uh, that we have here 
in studio during the show so you can literally see how it's made, um, which is always exciting to me, like true behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, I was testing that today. Yeah, yeah. true behind There's the scenes like, stuff. Yeah, this, this channel that everyone can hear. Yeah, about. and actually yeah. We're, we're testing some of this right now. So this is coming into play very, very rapidly. And we're also looking at doing some very interesting things in chat where you're going to be able to uh, maybe, you know, uh, influence well, what ends up going. We're not talking so, about that yet. Yeah, but you know, we'll <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get the, we'll cross that bridge when the chat comes up with that. So uh, so lots of cool stuff on the horizon. And also, if you can't help us out via YouTube or Patreon, subscribing, hitting that notification bell somewhere uh, up there because we are doing a lot of letting off steams now. And in fact, uh, Jamie and Carrie Ann uh, did one this week uh, where they went to a bar and talk space and you bought them all drinks. Uh, so I'm expecting you all to buy me drinks uh, when I do a letting off steam, regardless of where I am at. Um, so have them delivered or something, I don't care, just make it happen uh, whenever I get around to doing my own letting off steam. Uh, also, you can head on over to community.tmro.tv, post there, help us out in <laughs> whatever ways you feel. Post us everywhere, help us reach our mission goal, which is to get people excited about space. And I think that about wraps it up for Orbit 12.33, so thanks for tuning in, and until the next one, keep exploring. Longest wrap up ever. Thank you.